That video always lasts like, a, like two measures longer than I think it's going to. I'm always like tempted to get up. Always, always. Hey guys, it's that Sunday. Everyone's been waiting for it. You've been asking for it. You guys have been, I <laughs> know, you guys have been, Danae's laughing. You guys have been waiting for it and asking for it. So here it is. This is the Sunday where we talk about sex. This is, <laughs> just a heads up. Just a warning. We're going there in a PG sort of way today. Just mild kind of suggestive themes. It's not, nothing explicit this morning. But we have to, we have to. We're in uh, our seventh week of our series on the Ten Commandments, seven out of ten weeks. And the seventh commandment, of course, says, oh, why don't you stand with me and we'll read it together. Do not commit adultery. You may be seated. <laughs> Uh, Lord Jesus, we um, come before you right now and we laugh because we feel so dang awkward um, because we're touching um, parts of, I don't know, we're getting really deep into, it's not just an external thing we're talking about this morning, it's really deep um, in the very um, deepest, hungriest parts of us, the places of us that long most um, for intimacy and long ultimately for you. And so um, we ask that you would grant us ears to hear your spirit this morning, um, that you would um, be at work. We invite you. We invite you as best we know how, together as a community, we invite your spirit to be um, moving and healing among us this morning, uh, mending the places where we're desperately broken or wounded, um, encouraging the places where we're longing and we're impatient, um, announcing gospel in the places where we are filled with regret we ask that you would come speak this morning, um, that your spirit would be the one preaching this morning. And we ask these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. So I hear the seventh commandment. I hear that thou shalt not, I guess that's the King James, but thou shalt not commit adultery has been committed to my memory. Um, I hear that commandment and I, like, I immediately apply it to like the nuclear family. Don't you? Like you think about it and you apply it immediately to the nuclear family of like the 20th or the 21st century. I tend to think about like mom and dad from Leave it to Beaver or something like that. That's the image, whatever it is, Mr. and Mrs. Brady from the Brady Bunch, something. I tend to think about Mr. and Mrs. Uh, uh, Cleaver. I, I originally had Beaver because I've never seen an episode of this. And, 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 and Joy, my wife, was like, it's Cleaver, dear. And, uh, and so I had to go through all of my notes and make sure Cleaver, Cleaver, Cleaver. You, I tend to think about Mr. and Mrs. Cleaver, even though I've never seen an episode of Leave it to Beaver. And I tend to think that dad shouldn't step out on mom. And mom shouldn't step out on, on dad. And I am, abs hear me, I am absolutely right to think that way about, the, about the, um, the seventh commandment. Mr. and Mrs. Cleaver should not step out on each other. That is adultery. That's right, that's adultery. But what's interesting, and perhaps a little disturbing to us, is that's not quite how the original hearers of this commandment would have heard the seventh commandment. No, that's a little disturbing. Adultery actually meant something a little different in the ancient Near East than it does now. Um, and to make things even more complicated, and the command actually meant something, it actually landed differently with the two different genders that heard it. And so we, we put it up on a slide this way. In the ancient world, if uh, adultery for women meant that you meant you're sleeping with any man that you're not married to. Adultery for men equals sleeping with a married woman. That's what, that's what it meant. I know, I'm seeing faces. That's what it meant in the ancient Near East. If you were Mrs. Cleaver in the ancient world, you committed adultery when you slept with any man besides Mr. Cleaver. 
That sounds familiar to us. That's adultery. Uh, adultery is happening when Mrs. Cleaver sleeps with anyone who's not Mr. Cleaver. Got it! I'm, I'm there following you so far. But if you were Mr. Cleaver in the ancient world, you committed adultery by sleeping with any woman who was married. Mr. Cleaver commits adultery when he sleeps with any other married woman. A married man sleeping with an unmarried woman. Uh, No, I'm feeling like the tension rising in the room. Don't worry. Sleeping, I know. Uh, A married man sleeping with an unmarried woman is a a little bit of a different situation. It's not quite adultery in the ancient Near East. Um, And the God's commandments are coming to people who live in the ancient Near East. Deuteronomy 22. You want something from the Bible? Fine, I'll give you something from the Bible. Deuteronomy 22 actually gives us a really great example of this. Uh, Actually gives guidelines on this. If a situation like this happens to arise, it says if a man, let's say Mr. Cleaver, if Mr. Cleaver meets up with a young woman who is a virgin and not yet engaged, so she's not any part of the married process, If he meets up with a young woman who's a virgin and not engaged, grabs her, yikes, and has sex with her, they are caught, and they are caught in the act, the man who had sex with her must give 50 silver shekels to the young woman's father. She will also become his wife, because she wants to, right? He grabbed her in a field and like, no, she she will also become his wife because he has humiliated her. He is never allowed to divorce her. Now question for all of us who are uncomfortable in the room at this point. (laughs) Who is the wounded party in this situation? Who is getting paid in this situation? It's not a trick question. In the ancient world, where women are treated as property, the person most wronged by Mr. Cleaver grabbing and having sex with a virgin daughter is the virgin's dad. Dad is the wounded party. Dad gets 50 silver shekels. Daughter gets to become Another Mrs. Cleaver. Maybe number two. Maybe number ten. (laughs) It's hard to tell. Mr. Cleaver, um, Mr. Cleaver becomes responsible for protecting her in a harsh world. He becomes responsible for for providing for her in a male-dominated economy. And he cannot ever shirk his responsibility. He can never get out of this by at any point by, like, divorcing her. Dad's the wounded party who needs to be compensated, though, because adultery in the ancient world, the place to which God's law originally came, the culture in which it originally came to, adultery in the ancient world was primarily understood to be about protecting which gender? Men. Protecting men's rights, protecting men's property, protecting men having rightful heirs. It's it's only adultery in the ancient world if Mr. Cleaver sleeps with another married woman. If she's unmarried, like Deuteronomy said, then, well, I mean, it's still an issue. There are still laws that address it, but it's not... It's not quite adultery. It doesn't quite fit in there. Mr. Cleaver may just wind up with a second or third or fifth Mrs. Cleaver, but no one's going to get killed. No one's going to be pulling out stones to stone anybody or anything like that. Um, That's something like how the commandment was originally understood by its original ancient audience. And, And just by show of hands, so you know you're not alone in the room, how many of us find this incredibly disturbing? Right. Yeah, me too. Um, we're gonna. Don't worry. We're getting to the to the to the meaning of adultery that we're more familiar with. Um, but I couldn't skip over this because uh, I care too much about what the Bible actually says. I care too much about what the Bible actually meant in its original context. I want all of you to to know and to be like 
when if an atheist or an agnostic or whoever is like attacking the Bible, like it matters what the Bible actually says and the and where the Bible actually like the the culture that it actually emerged in, um, and the culture that God spoke to. The ancient hearers of this commandment heard something different than us, um, and so maybe before we uh, say anything else about adultery, we could say this: um, we could say God always meets us in the midst of human brokenness. His commands always, all of us feel like really uncomfortable with how far down God descends to a culture. He's giving commands to a culture that's like totally alien to us, totally foreign to us. We cannot even imagine. Um, But God met society of the ancient world where it was at. That's what God's like. God is more patient than we, than I I have any, God's more patient than I want him to be, right? God is, God's grace and God's commandments do not come to an idealized version of human society. They come to a society that we barely recognize. God's grace and God's commandments do not come to an idealized version of anything. Thank you. Because I'm not ideal. (laughs) None of us are ideal. Um, So it's actually a bit of gospel that God always meets us in the midst of human brokenness. God comes to the world and speaks commandments and grace to the world where it is. God's always graciously working with the conditions on the ground. God always meets us where we are at and invites us into deeper, truer, better life. And make no mistake for the ancient Israelites, for the ancient world, deeper and truer life is there. It's always been on offer from like page one of the scripture. It may have been an oral story that was being passed around, but it's the oldest story that's been been there. It's from page one of the scripture. There's always been, when it comes to sex, when it comes to men and women, when it comes to relationship, there has always been an ideal, uh, an aim, a goal that to which human, humanity has been aimed. Whether or not Israel ever lived that way. It's the creation story. It's Genesis 1 and 2. We're familiar with it a little bit. Adam, Eve, a garden. The woman, not as property, but as partner. That's the, that's the ideal to which that's always been held before the ancient people of God. One man and one woman bonded in lifelong loyalty and partnership. We call it marriage, is what we call it. That's God's ideal. That's God's design. It's been there from page one, regardless of how far God had to descend to speak grace and commandment to his people. That's what God had in mind. One man, one woman bonded in lifelong loyalty. But when things go south, when things fall apart, when humanity turns away from God and becomes corrupt, and broken and distorted and genders being treated as property rather than partner, God graciously does not wait for an ideal. God meets us in the midst of our brokenness. And he gives ancient Israel a commandment that gets understood in a particular way in their ancient culture, but he meets them where they're at. And the, but beneath it all, the ancient story of creation is always there calling them deeper, truer, better. And do you know who it is that explicitly clarifies this commandment? Who it is? Yes! Yes! We have a 
gold star buzzer. Do you know who it is that explicitly clarifies this commandment, who eventually like levels the playing field for the genders, who explicitly names, hey, you've gotten it wrong. You've misunderstood. Hey, I met you where you're at. Like you have to meet a two-year-old where they're at, but you're growing up. And so I call you into what you're supposed to be doing, what this was always about. The person who explicitly names monogamy as God's design for marriage, the person who names it is God. God. God come among us. God dwelling among us in Jesus of Nazareth. We'll put it right here on the screen. He says, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. And you've thought a lot of things about what that means, but let me tell you what it means. I say to you, every man who looks at a woman lustfully has already broken this has already violated this. You can't be going into a field grabbing anybody. You can't even be thinking about it. And that's quite a shift, isn't it? That's quite a shift. God the Son coming among us shifts our attention from our sex life to our thought life. He he shifts our attention from what we're doing in the privacy of our bedroom to what we're doing in the privacy of our brain. You know, he's like, Jesus says, I know you've always thought about adultery one way. And I I know that I had to meet you where you're at, but let me tell you the best way to think about it. Let me tell you what this was always aimed at. Don't even fantasize. Don't cultivate lust in your heart at all. Jesus actually goes on in Matthew 19. This is like just a bit over a dozen chapters later. He Jesus himself is the one who points back to that early story, that ancient primordial story found on page one of scripture. He points back to the creation story as God's ideal for marriage. That is the place for sex in human lives, in human society, in human culture. According to this design of creation, to the words of Jesus, to the wisdom of the church handed down century after century, I will say it clearly, sexual activity properly belongs between one man and one woman bonded in lifelong loyalty and commitment called marriage. Everything else is adultery. Everything else is adultery, even our thought life. Even our thought, like Jesus, like jacks up the volume on this on this commandment. Even your thought life, what you're doing in your brain. A lot of times, a lot of times we can get the impression from like what Jesus is saying or the wisdom of the church, blah blah blah. All of what you're saying, Brett, but it it makes it sound like what you're saying, Brett, makes it sound like sex is a problem. It makes it sound like sex is this problem that the church is like, oh, you have to do it in this sort of way. Or da, 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 da. Doesn't it? Sometimes you just get the impression, especially culture out there, will get the impression that sex is like a problem in the church. So maybe we should just come out and say this. Sex is a gift. Sex is a gift from God. It is not, don't idealize it though if you're single. Like sex is not God's greatest gift to humanity. It's just a gift to you. All the married people in the room are laughing. It's true. Sex isn't God's greatest gift to humanity. It's a gift. It's a beautiful, sacred, good gift. It is sacred and holy. In fact, the picture of one man and one woman married in love, loyal, erotic, is a frequent picture of Jesus and us. In scripture. Yeah, that's right. It's a picture of Christ and the church. Uh, Paul one of, uh, actually writes it this way in Ephesians chapter 5. I'm looking at the screen as a leap of faith. There we go. <laughs> no, you're like, is it going to show up? You're with me. Uh, thank you for whoever. Ryan, you rock. He, Ryan runs, he, he rocks. Anyway, um, as for husbands, love your wives just like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. He did this to present himself with a splendid church. Church, one without any sort of stain or wrinkle on her clothes, but rather one that is holy and blameless. That's how husbands ought to love their wives in the same way as they do their own bodies. Anyone who loves his wife loves 
himself. No one ever hates his own body, but feeds it and clothes it. No one ever goes out in a field and grabs her and just takes her. Feeds his body, takes care of it, just as Christ does for the church, because we are parts of his body. Do you hear the intimacy here? Do you like it? Tenderness, feed her, clothe her, love as your own body take care of. Give yourself up as Christ gave himself up. That's the gospel, by the way. Just to let you guys know, if you need to hear it this morning, the, the husband and the wife and the marriage bed is a picture of like the deepest realities of what, what's going on in the universe. It's the deepest truth about the world that Jesus, God made human, loves us all of us with the deepest, most passionate, most intimate, most giving, most loyal kind of love. The kind of love that endlessly gives of himself, that endlessly loves, that cares for the good of the other at great cost to himself. That's the gospel. That in Jesus, God gives himself up for our good. God gives himself up for our, God takes our death. That's the cross. God takes our death on himself. And here's the resurrection. God endlessly gives us his life, shares it. Why don't you just trust in the son of man and he'll share resurrection with you? That's what God is like. Sacrificial, self-giving love, even when it's painful, even when it requires death. That is what is woven into the very fabric of creation to the universe at its deepest levels. We could say it this way. Um, Jesus shows us that true life is about what we can give, not what we can get. Let's read that again. Jesus shows us, because we don't believe it, Jesus shows us that true life is about what we can give, not what we can get. That's really a picture of the entire purpose of marriage. If you're, key, if you're taking notes, if you're keeping score, two people, a husband and a wife, learning to give to each other. Give, not get. Give to each other in every conceivable way. Two people learning loyalty together. Two people learning sacrifice together. Two people learning in the, in the security of a lifelong commitment what sex is about, what it means to give physically to each other. Truest, deepest life is about what we can give, not what we can get. So, and just, uh, that applies to sex too. For all of those who are married in the room, who want the insight, I, I didn't, this isn't original with me, but uh, the deepest joy of sex is the pleasure of giving pleasure. That's what, if you go into sex thinking, uh, what can I get out of this? You are going to experience what, uh, I saw a study that came out this week, four out of 10 men, at least, uh, sometime in their uh, lifetime, experience um, unexpected, unexplainable sadness after, after having sex. That's men, that's not just women who are wired deeply like with, with emotional wiring that, I, like, that baffles me. Um, you, it's a gift, it's a gift. No, I, I, for whatever, it, it's a gift to, to, the, to, to our race that, that we don't just have people hitting you know, rocks on, on trees. And anyway, um, the deepest joy of sex is the pleasure of giving not the pleasure of getting. And so um, 
I think now, if we actually begin to like take our cues from Jesus and his life and him giving of his life and the fact that this is God doing it. And so that means that self-giving, sacrificial, to the point of pain and death, love is what is woven into the very fabric of the universe. And once we begin to recognize that that's what sex is about too, that like the deepest joy of sex is about what you can give to another person, not what you can get from somebody. I think finally we're in a place where we can talk about adultery for a second. Because adultery is especially toxic because adultery is never about giving. That's, what's the pro- that's the essential problem with adultery or pornography or that romance novel. Sorry, I, that's what it is. We've got to call it. The problem with adultery and all of the kinds of forms of sexual sin is that it's, it's about taking It's about what can I get? In fact, we should put that on a slide. Adultery is always taking, never giving. It's always taking, never giving. That's why scripture, especially the wisdom literature, that's not really like moralizing about it. The wisdom literature in the Bible is just saying it's really stupid. Don't live your life in a stupid kind of way. But the Bible from cover to cover, scripture warns us so strongly against adultery because it's always taking, never giving. That's why a proverb like this could get handed down to us. It's Proverbs 6, um, verse 32. It may or may not have made it into a slide. If not, uh, Proverbs 6, 32, jot it down. He who commits adultery is senseless. Doing so, he destroys himself. He who commits adultery is senseless. Doing so, he destroys himself. Adultery destroys. Not because there's anything wrong with sex. Sex is sacred and good and beautiful and powerful. And that is precisely why adultery destroys. We could say it this way, sex is especially powerful and so adultery is especially poisonous. Sex is especially powerful and so adultery is especially poisonous. Adultery poisons us destroys us in the language of the Proverbs because it runs against the grain of the universe. It breaks that fabric that the universe is made of. The universe is made of self-giving, sacrificial, painful, cross-shaped love. And adultery is nothing like that. It's just taking and never giving. And so that's the real danger of adultery. In all sexual sin, it, it, whether it's, we're sleep, who it's who we're sleeping with or who we're chatting with online or what images we're clicking on or the fantasies that we escape into, the danger is that we are becoming increasingly consumed with ourselves. That we are getting lost in ourselves and increasingly disconnected from others. And the real world, the real world is the world of Jesus. Vulnerable relationships, self-giving, sacrificial love. An author uh, named Garrett Kaiser, um, this is life-changing. Let's write it down or watch the podcast or something, no joke. Garrett Kaiser is an author. He puts it this way. The God of Genesis is characterized. So this is what the God of Genesis looks like. He's characterized in part by the pleasure he takes. God takes pleasure. He's a pleasure-taking God in what he has made. And God saw that it was good. He takes the worldview of the envious and to to a certain extent of the lustful and the avaricious as well. So the worldview of everybody who's like, oh, I'm just so hungry, I can't, I can't get enough, I'm envious of what they want, I'm lustful after that person, whatever. This worldview runs counter to God's vision and who God is. Nothing they see is good or good enough or else nothing they see is enough of the good. In other words, you can never please them, which is good a definition as you may get of what it means to be damned. Yeah. 
when our lives become consumed with getting rather than giving. Adultery is a case point example, textbook example of this. Eventually, we find ourselves dangerously perched here. Nothing is good or good enough or else nothing I see is enough of the good. And so we sleep with the next person. We click on the next website. We chase the next fantasy. We read the next romance novel. And there is this huge danger, not just in sex, but in all of life, that we would become insatiable. That we would never be able to be filled. That we would never be pleased that every bit of our lives, including our sexuality, would become consumed with filling ourselves. And we're like Barbosa in Pirates of the Caribbean. We can't even taste the apple anymore. We're always taking, never giving. And at that point, our lives, this is the danger, our lives become the complete opposite of the life of God what the fabric of the universe is made of. It's a damnation kind of life, is what it is. As I was preparing the sermon, I I kept picturing a human heart. I couldn't shake the image. I kept picturing like a human heart, you know. I looked for like, try to find one, but like if it's not Halloween time, they're not in season. And so like, (laughs) they cost a lot. Um, And so like, you'll have to just imagine with me, a human heart, but it's a human heart. It's the kind of human heart that has become more interested in getting blood than it is in giving blood, in pumping blood away into all the things connected with it. The human heart is this organ that's designed to give everything that it receives. That is what the human heart is. It gives away. You give it blood, it immediately gives it away to everything else, and that's how it and everything connected with it finds life by giving away. The heart receives blood through the veins and then it always relentlessly just gives that blood away through the arteries. The heart is endlessly, regularly receiving the goodness of the blood. But imagine if this heart became obsessed with the goodness of the blood if it became obsessed with getting that blood rather than giving that blood, if it became obsessed with the blood, it just wants more, more, more blood, more blood. It's like a vampire kind of heart, you know, is what, the, what this thing is. Uh, what would quickly happen to the vampire heart? The wisdom of the Proverbs tell us a vampire heart is senseless and it destroys itself everything connected with it. Adultery is a vampire heart. Adultery is a vampire heart. Our being self-consumed ends up with our being consumed. (laughs) Self-obsession ends in self-destruction. This goes for singled, married. If you're obsessed with what your partner can give you in the bedroom or out of the bedroom, Let me just tell you, you're going to destroy your marriage. Marriage is about what you can give, not what you can get. Here's the thing. A vampire heart ends up destroying itself and the pet gospel the passion of God, all of the wisdom of the church with regards to sex, the passion of God is our fulfillment, not our destruction. God warns us against adultery because it never fills us. It never fulfills. We've all experienced this, haven't we? We've all experienced this. Whether we've ever committed adultery in the bedroom or we've committed it in the brain. Every single one of you. Adulterers. <laughs> I'm the chief. For we've committed it in our, in our heart. We know it. We've experienced it not filling us. We know that it does not satisfy. It never, ever fulfills. We've all experienced the brokenness of our sexualities. We don't, 
We all laugh about a sermon talking about sex because we've all experienced the brokenness of our sexualities in different sorts of ways. Our, the, how our appetites and our longings just uh, aching for something in some form or another. You're not crazy when you chase things and you finally get them, they don't satisfy. They don't fill. God wants us fulfilled and he tells us there is a path to life that will satisfy you. It's the path of the cross. It's the path of self-giving love of what you can give, not what you can get. And we are invited, all of us, um, I recognize that where there are lots of we're all in different places with regards to this. We're you're invited this morning in your brokenness, in your shame, in your deep hunger. You're invited to take a different path than the path of what can I get? What can I get? You are invited to follow Jesus. Um, if the band wants to come up back up, um, we're just gonna. I want to close by just reading a bit of Jesus. This is the story about Jesus, and I think what he speaks to us this morning. This is found for us in John 8. And Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he returned to the temple. All the people gathered around him, and he sat down and taught them. The legal experts and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in the act, caught in adultery, placing her in the center of the group. We like to do that, don't we? We like to throw sex right into the middle and say, that's the sin above every sin. That is the brokenness of brokenness right there, placing her in the center of the group. They said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. Where's the man? We don't know. We're living in a world where men get off scot-free. This woman, though, we brought to you. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone women like this. What do you say? They said this to test him because they wanted a reason to bring an accusation against him. Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground with his finger. They continued to question him, so he stood up and replied, whoever hasn't sinned should throw the first stone. Bending down again, he wrote on the ground. Those who heard him went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. Finally, only Jesus and the woman were left in the middle of the crowd. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Is there no one to condemn you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus, God made man, said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, don't sin anymore. Here, once again, we find the God of Israel of incredible, uncomfortable patience meeting humanity in our brokenness. When adultery gets clarified, my friends, everyone gets broken. Everyone gets broken. And God meets us in our brokenness. God does not wait on an idealized version of society, of us, to arrive. He meets us, you, with whatever you've carried in, whatever you're struggling with. He meets you right where you are, and he meets us in our brokenness, and he calls us, he invites us out of our brokenness into deeper truer and better lives. We find ourselves this morning in the midst of an uncomfortable topic in the presence of a God who says you are not condemned. You are not condemned. And so the invitation this morning, as we're about to come forward and receive communion, the invitation this morning is to let Jesus gaze at you. Let Jesus gaze at you. Let his words and his passion pierce you. Let his words sink in. God, give us the grace to believe your words. I do not condemn you. And give us the grace to say yes to your invitation. 
Give us the grace to say yes to no more sin. Give us the grace to say yes to a lifetime of saying no to sin. May we say no to the vampire heart and say yes to a bleeding gospel heart, to a pumping heart, a living heart consumed with giving love. Because in that giving, we are filled by you.